Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the Atmospheric Event-Based Research Using NASA Global Hydrology Resource Center, or GHRC, Distributed Active Archive Center, which is an acronym, uh, the acronym for that is DAC, or GHRC DAC Tools and Services Webinar. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. While everybody is logging in here, you will see the two optional polls located at the bottom left and middle portion of the page. And I would like to thank you for your feedback on these polls. I do have 2 p.m. Eastern time, so we are going to go ahead and get started. What I'd like to do first is go over a few housekeeping items related to this webinar. To ensure the best audio experience, the conference has been placed in silent mode. However, if you have any issues or you have any questions, what I'd like for you to do is enter those into the Q&A pod located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. And again, this works like a chat. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted both to our online Adobe Connect webinar catalog as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a couple of days of completion. And I do plan to provide that uh, URL to all of you at the end. All presentation files will also be available for download at the end of the webinar. <clears throat> If you're experiencing an echo, the one thing you might need to do um, if you're dialed into audio by way of uh, just addressing a Q&A um, question, if you're dialed in, you want to make sure you have muted your built-in computer speakers. All right, great. Let me continue on here. As far as timing for today's webinar, the webinar will be one hour long. We've allocated 45 minutes to the presentation and live demonstration with an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. So after our speaker has finished her presentation, what we'll do then is we'll move to a final set of polling questions, and then from there we will transition directly to the Q&A period. You will have an opportunity to ask your questions throughout all portions of the webinar, with the exception of the live demonstration. And again, you'll use the Q&A pod. It works like a chat. Due to the large number of participants, we will not uh, address questions using the raising hand function, it has been disabled. And then just one final note, depending upon the volume of questions that are received, we will extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes to 3.15 p.m. Eastern time for those of you who may wish to stay on the line. What I'd like to do next is move to our agenda, so let me pull that up for everybody here. During the first few minutes, our speaker will provide an provide an introduction to the NASA GHRC DAC and its tools and services. And then from there, we'll transition to a description of our Hurricane Ingrid use case. Uh, we'll spend about half of the webinar on a live demonstration of various tools and services that can be used to investigate this severe weather event. And then finally, we will wrap up today's session with a recap of what was shown today. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Amanda Weigel, who is a research associate at the NASA JHRC DAC. Amanda? Uh, hi, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. As Jennifer just introduced, my name is Amanda Weigel. I'm a part of the science team at the Global Hydrology Resource Center. Uh, today I'll be presenting on atmospheric event-based research using GHRC tools and services. So to provide you with some general background information about GHRC, uh, we are one of NASA's 12 uh, Earth Observing System uh, Distributed Active Archive Centers. Um, now each of these, these archive centers, or DAC, serves uh, one or more specific scientific disciplines. Um, GHRC, we are located at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, and we are also a collaborative effort between the University of Alabama and Huntsville and NASA. Uh, so we abide by the ESDIS mission uh, statement to make data active, uh, usable, and interoperable. Um, internally, our own mission statement is to provide uh, a comprehensive active archive uh, with a focus on hazardous weather, uh, its governing and dynamical physical processes, and then the associated applications to use this data for. Uh, so within GHRC, we, we, our data currently focuses mainly on lightning, tropical cyclones, and storm-induced hazards. Um, and this data is collected through instruments such as satellites, um, aircraft, and then uh, in-situ data sets. 
Uh, so to address these needs and abide by the ESDIS vision, uh, GHRC, we've worked to provide users with a series of tools and services to make our data more discoverable um, and usable. And so the goal of these services is to allow users to transition uh, between learning about a specific uh, topic, science question, a research area, uh, then using that information to identify the data available to study it, obtain it, and then the final step is understanding how to use that data toward scientific analysis. Um, so the goal of these tools is that they can be used sequentially um, in order to identify information and then move through the process of data analysis. Um, and so to do this, again, we've created a series of tools that work through um, and are vital for studying a research question in a scientific process. Um, so this first step of the process is identifying information, um, and this is where you would use your micro-articles. And these micro-articles are short, interesting documents. Um, they introduce a specific science topic, event, instrument, um, and it also provide a curated list of GHRC data that's available to study it. So it's a one-stop shop for finding out information um, about a scientific event or instrument, um, and then what data is available to study it. The second portion is exploring and um, evaluating data available. So to do this, we have newly revamped our Hydro uh, 2.0 search tool. So this is our data search and download tool uh, for locating archived data here at GHRC DAC. Uh, thirdly, uh, the next portion of, of the process generally is um, evaluating data. So let's say we have a research question. We've evaluated the data available. Now we want to take a closer look at it. Uh, so that we've created a field campaign explorer. So this allows data visualization, discovery, and acquisition, um, catering specifically to event-based research. This is where users can um, interactively explore data available around an event. Um, and then the final step in this sort of research process is um, using the data to perform a task. So for that, we've created data recipes. Um, and these are step-by-step -step documents that explain how to do a task with the data, whether it's uh, plotting a recipe or bringing the data into a certain software or even searching for it within our own GHRC page. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to apply these processes to uh, study a specific atmospheric event. Uh, so for today, we've selected Hurricane Ingrid. Um, it occurred in September of 2013. Uh, in the MODIS True Color imagery to the right, uh, we have uh, Mexico. And on September 15th through 16, it was hit by Hurricane Manuel in the Pacific to the west and Ingrid to the east in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and due to this event, it caused uh, significant rainfall, which re um, resulted in flooding and several landslide or rainfall-induced hazards, such as landslides. Um, and this, in turn, ended up killing 130 people. Um, so taking a closer look at this, this satellite image that we have depicted, um, you can start to raise a question. And you do see here um, in this zoomed-in inset of Hurricane Ingrid itself, we see these areas of uh, more enhanced uh, convective cloud cover, uh, which, which raises the question, you know, what, what is convective cloud cover? What are we observing in this image of Hurricane Ingrid? So what does convective cloud cover mean? Um, within satellite imagery, convective cloud cover, it appears as these brighter white and more defined areas. Um, these areas are brighter and more defined due to its greater height in the atmosphere and then also the number of water droplets. And uh, this, these higher thickness and quantity of water actually scatters the solar radiation coming down to the Earth so that the satellite uh, retrieves more information and these brighter convective regions um, appear bumpy and um, more defined. Um, so then, Within this, you, know, you can see in this aqua modus image collected on December 2nd, 2013, um, I've highlighted a region that's more bumpy and more defined, indicating an area of stronger convection. Um, so then the process of you know, how are these convective clouds formed? Well, they're formed um, in environments that are unstable. And this means that vertically in the Earth's atmosphere above the surface, there's a temperature difference. 
meaning the surface or lower in the atmosphere is warmer than higher in the atmosphere. Um, and this difference causes air parcels to move in an upwards direction. So when you look at these convective clouds, you see this bubbling feature. And you can think of air parcels moving upwards, bubbling, sort of like boiling. Um, and then the important feature about convection is that strong convection is necessary for hurricane development. So when we're looking at visible satellite imagery and we're seeing these areas of more enhanced uh, convection, these defined clouds, um, it's an indicative of hurricane development, uh, strengthening hurricanes, and intensification. So as we've looked at that um, and provided the background on atmospheric convection, this raises a science question. So taking a look at the, the MODIS true color satellite imagery of Hurricane Ingrid, I just showed, um, and then understanding the impacts that Hurricane Ingrid had on Mexico, the, the precipitation-induced hazards that caused 130 fatalities. We can raise this science question, and it is, do areas of enhanced convective cloud cover visible in satellite imagery of Hurricane Ingrid coincide with high precipitation intensity? Um, so we want to see if, um, essentially, what the precipitation uh, measurements are like um, collected for this hurricane as compared to the true color satellite imagery we previously observed. Um, so for this specific event for Hurricane Ingrid, um, it was actually studied by the Hurricane and Severe Storm Sentinel, or HS3, uh, airborne field campaign. Uh, this was a five-year mission that studied uh, hurricane intensity and formation change in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this campaign used uh, global hawk UAVs and flew them into a series of storms. Um, for this specific event, uh, the flight was flown on September 15, 2013, which is actually the same day as the MODIS true color satellite imagery we've been looking at. And on this event, it was carrying um, the instruments uh, HIRAP, HIRAD, CPL, and HAMSER. So today we will be looking at and focusing on the data collected by HAMSER um, and understanding how it relates to precipitation. So some background on HAMSTER. Um, HAMSTER stands for the High Altitude Mimic Sounding Radiometer. Uh, this is a passive microwave remote sensing instrument that is situated above, aboard the Global Hawk UAV. Um, so what it does is it detects emitted uh, microwave radiation from both the Earth's surface um, and levels of the atmosphere. And this information is used to study the thermodynamic state of the atmosphere. So it collects information on water vapor concentration um, as well as temperature profiles. Um, so using these measurements of radiation, um, it derives an observation called brightness temperature. And using this brightness temperature measurements, um, it's input into an algorithm to derive something called uh, reflectivity profiles. Um, and these reflectivity profiles, um, as I said, they're, they're related to brightness temperature. Um, and brightness temperature um, can indicate storm precipitation structure. So these profiles are used to estimate, essentially, precipitation intensity and, and for this example, um, specifically with hurricanes. Uh, so we'll be examining uh, the Hamster data collected and specifically the radar reflectivity profiles and comparing them to the true color satellite imagery uh, we have been observing. Um, so now that we've, we've set the scene on the instrumentation used in our science question, let's review the steps of this, this research process that we're developing here. Um, so the first step in a, in a general process, and then also for our process today, is you want to learn more about the topic. Today we're going to focus on, as our first step, we want to learn more about Hurricane Ingrid. Uh, what happened, what data was collected, what were the areas of scientific importance. Step two is then further evaluating uh, what data is available to cover this event. We need to evaluate um, our data holding specifically for HS3. And then step three brings us to exploring um, any other available data, ancillary data, that may not necessarily uh, BHS3, uh, but is still available so that we can explore our options and further develop our, our research query. Fourth, uh, 
So the next step is once we've identified the data, we want to work to identify uh, where it's coinciding these areas of high precipitation intensity would theoretically coincide with the enhanced convective cloud cover observed in the MODIS imagery. Um, so with that, once that area is defined, we can select and download this desired data, and then finally use the data, close the gap, and create, finalize this research process by creating a plot of the data that can be used uh, for further analysis. Uh, so with that, um, I would like to transition over to the live demonstration portion of this webinar. Okay. Uh, so reiterating back to a research process, our step one is uh, learning more information about Hurricane Ingrid. So the first tool and resource that GHRC has created are these micro-articles. And so on the GHRC homepage, we have it at ghrc.nsfcc.nasa.gov. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have a series of icons listing data items. So the first one we're going to select today is microarticles. Um, and I already have this pulled up for us. So microarticles, uh, this icon brings you to a list of the microarticles that GHRC has compiled so far. Oh, and since today we are focusing on Hurricane Ingrid, we are going to access the Hurricane Ingrid um, micro article. So when we go to this page, um, you have the title. So the micro article discusses assessing wind and rain in Hurricane Ingrid during the HS3 field campaign. So automatically within this micro article, you can see it provides you an overview of this specific event, uh, what happened, when did it happen, what were the impacts. The next portion is understanding the science question. Um, what was of interest to scientists uh, for this specific campaign? The next portion to the right is taking a look. We have a sample image of uh, Hurricane Ingrid, as well as Manuel, affecting the Gulf of Mexico during landfall. But we can also extract sounds, such as spatial coverage. This is where, where in the world did this event occur? We have the time range, so we have two important um, aspects of the time. We have the full event, so what was the full duration of Hurricane Ingrid, but also as related to GHRC data and um, the HS3 field campaign, when is flight data available for um, Hurricane Ingrid for HS3? And then finally we have our event type. Then when we scroll down, there's information on uh, the data available, what instruments were aboard the Global Hawk when it flew to study Hurricane Ingrid available resources such as data recipes. And then finally, scrolling down lower, we have a curated list of data sets uh, for studying this specific event. And if you click on each of the data set names um, and links, it'll direct you to more information about each data set that you can read about, um, its user guide, and then provide you an overview of the data formats these data sets are provided in. Uh, then finally, when we move to the final section, again, we have a list of uh, key publications that not only describe the instrumentation used uh, to study the specific event, but some of the key science findings um, and information about Hurricane Ingrid as well. Um, so from the data recipe, we've, we've learned what happened during the event, but we've also gathered spatially and temporally when it happened, and then also which data sets for HS3 are available. So now I want to move on to the next portion of my scientific process, and that's investigating uh, what other data sets are available for me to answer this science question. So this brings us to the new Hydro 2.0 webpage. Um, as you can see, it allows you to interactively explore, filter, um, and evaluate GHRC data holdings. Um, so we're going to do a quick search for HS3 data available for Hurricane Ingrid. Uh, within the spatial box, I'm going to enter a spatial bound. I'm going to just draw the box of uh, where Hurricane Ingrid affected Mexico. I'm going to go ahead and cover the entire area here. So as you can see, that filters the data. Um, in addition, we have the temporal bounds. As you can see um, at the top, I have actually gone in and already entered uh, in this filter. So the data showing is from uh, September 15th through 16th, 2013. Uh, so here we have a list of 196 data items that, 
are available for this day and time and also the spatial extent of where Hurricane Ingrid occurred. Um, so with this, I want to further filter it down to just data sets available for HS3. So as I scroll down, I have this collection filter. Um, and if you navigate down, you can see there's an icon or a, a text listing HS3. So as I select that, it further filters my search down to just eight data sets. Um, and you can see all the instrumentation available. Um, this will also match up with uh, those listed in the, the data recipe that we previously observed. Um, so I am interested in the hamster data. So here at the bottom, I found it. Um, I want to learn more about hamster. So if I select the title and open it up, it will bring me to, this is what we call the data set landing page. This is where you as a user can go to understand more about the data, um, its coverage, its parameters, but then finally brings you links to access um, uh, browse imagery as well as documentation provided by the scientists and user guides, how to use the data, and then any other software packages that are available. Um, going back to our original search, we have these other icons towards the bottom. Uh, we have this mountain image to uh, view the browse imagery available for this hamster data. The down arrow allows you to uh, download data. It will bring you to a site where you can further refine um, your dates of interest. Uh, and then we have our, our list. This is our file list. This will bring us to a list of all the individual data granules available um, for cancer during this day, both level two and level three products. Um, so since today we've um, identified that hamster data is what we'd like to focus on, we, it, it brings up a need to um, better visualize and explore the hamster data available. We want to take a look at uh, where within this specific flight flown on September 15th um, did, was hamster data collected and where were higher areas of uh, precipitation or the ref reflectivity profiles observed. Uh, so this will bring us to the next step in the research process, and this is just further exploring and evaluating the data. And this is well, where we showcase the Field Campaign Explorer. Again, this is our, our interactive tool that allows you to explore data around a specific atmospheric event. And it has a series of features. Uh, the first feature is this mission reports portal. So within here, we've um, actually put all of the mission reports into a database. And you can access uh, each of these for each of the flights of HS3. So you can see here, uh, we have the Hurricane Ingrid mission report available. And I'll open that up really quick. And you can see mission reports are a venue where scientists use it to discuss the overall uh, weather conditions during the flight, any National Hurricane Center forecast or forecast discussions that are available, what they think would happen with the track. Um, but also, as they go through flight, they log um, different positions, interesting features, such as lightning they might observe. And I'll scroll down a little bit further so that you, you can see that, you know, here we have resources for this hurricane discussion on the forecast, um, but also we have imagery of um, the time along the flight or when um, they notice a specific feature, and then um, images collected. So here we have um, brighter cloud top height areas for the entire storm. Um, so it's just a, a location where you can get an idea of what were the scientists of the actual mission um, observing, placing special interest on, um, and then any issues they may have had during the flight, like they had to land early or a sensor failed. Um, so moving back to our, mission, our field campaign explorer. So when you go back to the front page, I'll show you real quick, you hit the Launch Now button. And this will bring you directly to our storm overview feature. So this storm overview feature works from pulling information from the NOAA HERDAT hurricane database. Um, and it collects storms for the collection years of 2011 through 2014. So right here we're displaying the year 2013. When you hover over each of these circles, uh, you can see it uh, provides a summary of key hurricane parameters such as wind speed, pressure, um, and storm duration. Another interesting feature we have is this ability to uh, 
interactively plot the data. So let's say I want to compare uh, minimum pressure with uh, maximum wind speed. So we can see here on the chart uh, where Hurricane Ingrid falls for the year of 2013. Um, so now that we've ex ex further explored Hurricane Ingrid compared to the storms during that year, um, now we want to look at the actual data collected for Ingrid. So we simply click on Ingrid, Ingrid and it will bring us directly to our Field Campaign Explorer. Um, so within this Explorer, we have a couple things I want to note. We have this interactive map viewer that has several data sets overlaid. Um, in yellow, we have the Global Hawk UAV flight track. As you can see, it starts up north. It actually starts um, up in Virginia, flies down into the Gulf, um, it, and then samples Hurricane Ingrid before returning home. We also have the uh, hurricane track for Hurricane Ingrid. So here in red with the dots along it um, is the hurricane track. Each dot represents a six-hour observation point um, of Hurricane Ingrid through the duration of the storm. Then finally, on the, on the bottom later, we have uh, let's see, hamster data plotted. Um, it's available in both 2 and 3D resolution. So you can take a look at the data um, and look at it both horizontally and then also see vertical cross sections. And then I'll also note that the, the underlying base map or imagery for this is actually um, a Terra Modis uh, satellite imagery collected on September 15, 2013. So this is acquired from Gibbs. Um, this data is shown to so that you can take a look visibly at what's going on with the hurricane um, and then compare it to the data collected by the HS3 instrument. Um, so this actually is the same exact imagery we saw earlier in the presentation. Um, you can see, hopefully you can see my, my cursor, but sort of towards the bottom, um, it's aligning with this, this area of brighter, whiter, higher convection. So you can see that the Global Hawk UAV uh, flew through these areas of enhanced convection uh, like we were, were interested in looking at during today's webinar. Uh, to show you the other features, uh, to the right, we have, um, we have a legend for the data being displayed in the map viewer. We also have um, an instrument status to let you know which of the Global Hawk instruments were functional. Um, and then finally, we have these images available. These are actually the same images that were acquired from the mission report that we previously saw. So as uh, you'll see in a minute, as we fly around and collect data, um, each of these images will highlight depending on where geographically and the time along the flight track that the plane is located. Uh, so to zoom in in a little bit more detail, um, we're going to go ahead and start this. Uh, this flight viewer allows you to um, speed up the, the velocity of the flight track, but also change its location on um, along the entire time that was studied. So I'll show you as we go, I'll speed it up a bit. But as you can see, as the hurricane flies along, it's collecting horizontal um, and vertical cross sections of the data, which is neat. And it'll, it allows you to zoom in and zoom out and explore the data. Um, so with that exploration, we want to identify this high precipitation area within Hurricane Ingrid. Um, so zooming back out, I'll speed up to when it was sampled. Um, so here we have it. It's around um, 20 UTC on September 15th. And so as you can see, the, Hur or the, the Global Hawk has flown around Hurricane Ingrid for a while, and now it's approaching uh, this these areas of brighter white visible cloud cover, but also in the data collected, uh, we're seeing these higher areas of red, which indicate um, higher precipitation intensity. So I'll let this go for a bit, and we'll see how Global Hawk flies over. So what we're interested in is we're interested, for example, is this, this single section along the flight track. We only want to understand this area where we have this, this high reflectivity observed. Um, and this, 
and see um, how it looks. So we want to collect data. We found our precipitation feature, um, and we want to download it um, and create a plot of it and see how it compares to the satellite imagery. Um, so another one of the features FCX offers is the subset capability. Um, and I'll scroll up a bit. We have scissors here. Um, so what you do here is you select, you click on certain portions of the flight track um, and the, the geographic location and um, the time along the flight track that was observed will automatically populate as your start and end point. Um, you can also select uh, which instruments and variables you'd like to plot. And then it provides you an option to uh, preview the data, the raw data itself, um, identify the browse imagery available, but also create uh, small preview plots on the fly. Uh, then finally, we have this option to uh, go ahead and download the data. And when we're downloading this data, we're only downloading that specific subset we defined. So instead of getting the whole data file uh, of this HS3 flight that started back in Virginia, we're only getting this small portion of the HS3 flight that flew over this high precipitation area that we just observed. Um, so for the sake of time, I will not uh, be downloading it today. I already have it pre-downloaded. Um, so now that we have worked through the process of understanding more about Hurricane Ingrid, identifying and now exploring the data available, then finally finding where we want to focus. We found this high precipitation feature uh, that was collected by the hamster data, but also in this true color satellite imagery, we see it's brighter, it's more right, it, it overlays, um, it coincides with each other. So we're going to finish up and address the final steps of the scientific process. Um, so the next tool we're going to focus on are the GHRC data recipes. Again, we return to our home page, um, and it's the further rightmost icon that says data recipes. Uh, as we select this, it will bring us to a data recipes page. Uh, right now, we have one publicly available, and this is our HS3 hamster radar reflectivity profile uh, data subset quick view. Uh, so when we select that, it brings us to our nice data recipe page. Uh, so here, as a user, this is the resource where that you can use to learn, un learn how to uh, use the data, perform a task with the data. So for this specific recipe, um, it, use a, it utilizes a Python script um, and, and creates a plot for your area of interest. Um, so you can see within this page, um, the HS3 data recipe provides you a quick description of what the plot does. It also moves on to provide an overview of uh, what type of data recipe is this. While it's data visualization, it lets you uh, take a look, plot, and preview data. Then also supporting software information. We understand, we can see here that uh, the data recipe is available as an IPython notebook, but also a regular Python script. And then also there's an access portion. It lets us know that everything for this data recipe is completely open and freely available and then also walks you to the location where you can download and acquire uh, the specific data recipe, which is uh, the GHRC GitHub account. And I'll show you this real quick. Um, as you can see here, we have a list of some of our data recipes. And you can simply select one of these to preview the code or select this green button to clone and download the data recipe. Um, so I already have these downloaded and pre-installed to my computer. Uh, so once they've been acquired, the next step is learning um, how do I use this. And so that's our, our next portion of the data recipe. It walks you through um, to use this data recipe. Uh, you need to um, have Python and then uh, Jupyter's Notebook already pre-installed on your computer if you want to use the data recipe. Um, it also lets you know what Python packages you need to have installed in your software in order to run it as well, so that you can automatically prepare um, and set up whatever environment as a, a user would like to use. Then finally, the steps walk you through um, what you need. It's downloading the data recipe, um, and then also the portions within the actual code that um, need to be altered in order to tailor it to the user needs. Um, so here we're saying we need to change uh, the input file so for this, we would substitute 
our uh, September 15th HS3 hamster flight. Um, and then also entering in the, the time period of interest. Uh, so um, I don't know if you noticed in, in the Field Campaign Explorer, uh, the high precipitation feature we observed was around 20 UTC. So I'd be interested in plotting to find out, uh, creating a plot of data collected for, let's say, an hour between uh, 20 and, and 21 UTC on September 15th. Um, and then finally, walking through the rest of it, um, uh, it aggregates information about the data um, and then brings you to resources such as the user guide and then overviews the key parameters for the specific data recipe. These files have several other parameters in them, um, but for this data recipe, we're only focusing on this certain hamster um, DBZ field, so it lets you know what the units are of the data in the, in the file and then if any other uh, scale factors are applied. Uh, so with that, I will show you the data recipe really quick. I'll switch browsers. Um, so here I have our data recipe already uploaded in Jupyter Notebook. Um, so you can see it, it walks you through. Um, here you have your uh, data file of interest. So I've simply substituted the September 15th flight track. Um, then gone through, edited my start and end time, the period I'm interested in, um, and then the rest of the code walks you, or, uh, walks you through how to plot the data. So um, it, it will run and create the plot for you, um, but if you're interested in altering the plot yourself um, it, or creating other val uh, variables, the code is there for you to learn um, how do I create these plots, or I would like to change this, the good starting point that uh, you can use to get more familiar with Python, but also uh, tailor the code to your own needs. Um, so then finally, we have this hamster reflectivity plot. Um, when you run the code, I'll enlarge this so you can take a look at it. It's not showing up. But um, so we have the code here um, subsetted to that specific point of time um, that we observed in the Field Campaign Explorer, and as you can see, um, as the Global Hawk UAV circled around, it encountered this, this higher area of uh, precipitation um, that aligned with the enhanced convective cloud cover. Um, so this, this shows that um, our question was, do these areas of enhanced convective cloud cover coincide with areas of higher precipitation intensity? Um, so using the Hamster Reflectivity question, we can say yes. Yes, it does, and um, each of three sampled these areas to study that. Um, so now this concludes our live demonstration portion of this webinar, and I'm going to now return back to conclude it. All right. uh, so just to recap, um, as we work through the scientific process using GHRC tools and services, this is what we learned. So first we took a look at the microarticles. Again, these provide uh, general information about um, either an atmospheric phenomena, a specific event, um, instrumentation, um, research publications, as well as relevant data available at GHRC um, available to study each of these. Um, and it serves as this first step of the process to learn more about um, the event Ingrid. Now, what did we learn from this data recipe? Uh, well, we did learn that uh, the HS3 field campaign data is available for Ingrid and it was used to study it. Uh, we understood the temporal and spatial bounds, uh, so the, the HS3 measurements were collected on September 15th um, in, around um, Mexico, near the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and then finally, we, we, def we determined which other data sets are available um, in total to study this event. So then moving on to the second portion, or the second step in this process, we used Hydro uh, 2.0. Um, with this, we took those spatial and temporal bounds extracted from the micro article and entered them into uh, search and explore more data available. We did identify that um, there is both HS3 and other data available for this time period and um, spatial location. 
Um, we located the HS3 hamster reflectivity data, and then we also identified that there's a need to preview the data um, in order to study Hurricane Ingrid and address this research question. Um, the third, fourth, and fifth steps involved using the field campaign data. Uh, we used it to explore the resources, such as the mission reports and the storm overview. Um, then used it to determine characteristics of Ingrid with respect to other storms. So we were able to um, compare compare those, compare the storm parameters. Um, then using it to identify these high reflectivity areas observed um, within Hurricane Ingrid that were sampled by the Global Hawk UAV. Determine a portion of the flight we were interested in. So we identified that high precipitation feature we used to subset the data um, and create that plot with the data recipe. Then finally, downloaded the data. Um, here we have plot the data. So this is the data recipe. Um, again, this data recipe, it, was, it described how to plot HS3 hamster data using either a Python script or Python notebook, um, which each of these requires installation of uh, Python, Jupyter Notebook, and Python packages on a user's computer. Uh, we then went in as a user and defined our variables, so our data file and flight time of interest, um, and then generated this plot here that can be used for further analysis. So then finally, in conclusion, to bring us back to the beginning, um, we asked the science question, do areas of enhanced convective cloud cover visible in satellite imagery of Hurricane Ingrid coincide with high precipitation intensity? Um, so you can see here we have Hurricane Ingrid in the red box. Um, and then zooming into its location, the Field Campaign Explorer, you can see that the Global Hawk UAV sampled and flew through these areas to collect measurements. Um, and then in the black box, we identified the specific higher precipitation feature we wanted to study in more detail. And using that information, we created a plot using the data recipe for further analysis. So in the end, we did find that areas of higher uh, precipitation intensity um, do coincide with areas of enhanced convective precipitation observed in the MODIS true color satellite imagery. Um, so in, in final today, uh, we, we worked to learn about uh, a specific atmospheric event, learn more about it. Uh, then we developed a science question and addressed it uh, using Earth observing system data. We then just demonstrated the use of how these DHRC tools and resources can be used as part of a scientific process to move from um, learning about a topic creating a question and then applying it for analysis to answer um, this question. Uh, then finally, we demonstrated uh, tools that show scientists and data users how to use data. So we're trying to uh, alleviate or alleviate that gap between um, data acquisition and then figuring out how to use the data. Um, so below, I have links to GHRC micro articles, Field Campaign Explorer, and data recipes. Uh, please go and, and explore these. Um, so in the future, just to make note, we are in the process uh, working with our user working group and other interested sciences to develop more micro articles and data recipes um, for 2017. Hydro 2.0 will become fully operational in March uh, 2017, so it is almost ready. And then finally, the Field Campaign Explorer uh, will be publicly available late this spring as well. So I would like to take a moment to thank my wonderful GHRC science team members who I could not have created this webinar without. They've offered such support and help, um, as well as all the other members at GHRC and ITSC who helped develop these tools and debug errors as we went through this process of the webinar, but, but also um, creating these uh, for you users. Um, and then also the, the HS3 science team for providing critical feedback. Uh, so for that, I have my references. And I am going to hand it back over to Jennifer. Thank you, everyone. All right, great. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, everybody. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move to a final set of polling questions. 
And I'll generally give these, um, we've got a, you know, a few here, so I'll give these about three minutes or so. And from there, we'll move directly to the Q&A period. So if you've asked a question earlier, um, not to worry, even though you don't see that um, area right now, those questions are persistent, and we will see them in three minutes or so and go ahead and address those questions. So this is some really excellent feedback, particularly from um, the people who are answering the question about how we can help beginners. And then the other, uh, so I've got a follow-up question. I mean, I can't see who's, who's answering the question, but um, when you refer to the real-world examples, just because this helps us in future development, you're referring to um, you know, use cases that uh, reference a specific you know, natural hazard or scientific event. Anybody could, you know, kind of type into there if that if I'm on the right track with that, that'd be helpful. Or are you referring more so to how these how this type of data and these tools benefit society? Anyone cares to kind of add a little bit more detail to that particular pod, that would be great. And then we'll give this just about 30 more seconds or so, and then we'll move directly to the Q&A period. Yes, okay, that's helpful. Thank you for the feedback. And I do agree with the, the individual who um, noted that the micro articles are helpful. I think having like a popular summary um, that's really accessible for people and, and really demonstrates the value of the work is, is definitely something that we should have for all of these. Is a one lane slides, yeah, okay.
feel free to email me um, with some of these questions, particularly if the data is not archived at this particular data center. So for example, there's some landslide tools that NASA has available in databases. There are a number of different data products and, and resources out there, and I'd be happy to address your questions or forward you to the proper um, data center. All right, everybody, with that, we are going to transition to the Q&A period. I know that we did have a question a bit earlier on while I'm pulling that up. Um, just a bit of information here. On the left, you'll see information about um, you know, where the webinar recording will be posted. So it'll be posted to our online Adobe Connect catalog. That is the tinyurl.com Earth Data webinar. Only through that link will you be able to scroll to the end and download the presentation files from today. Okay, and you'll see those located in the lower right-hand corner right now in the share pod. If you highlight any of those files, I've got the presentation in PDF and PowerPoint, you'll be then prompted to download the file. Okay, and then I'll also post the uh, recording to our YouTube channel. We currently have about uh, 80 or so earth science data discovery and access webinars and also really short data tip tutorial type of how-tos that are posted across the earth science disciplines on that channel. So why don't we move to the first question here. Um, all right, give me just one moment. Okay, so the first question, Amanda, is have you only collected data from named storms and which aircraft and years are included? I'm sorry, would you mind repeating that? I just unmuted and it blocked out. Oh, no problem. So the first question is, have you only collected data from named storms and which aircraft and years are included? Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming this is related to Field Campaign Explorer. Um, the data set, or the, sorry, the, the data collected uh, for the storms depended on um, what the HS3 scientists decided. So uh, the data that we're showcasing here um, is based off science or the science selection. So I believe the majority of them were named. There were a few tropical storms in there as well. Um, so the data within there, uh, within FCX, spans 2011 through 2013, focusing on the specific storms that were um, researched at the time. Um, so we did not actually um, collect the data ourselves, uh, but we, we archive it here and create these tools. And, and FCX was developed so that it had um, a flexible framework where um, other data sets can be added for exploration and other campaigns as well. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Does that answer the question for the user who had the question? Um, if not, go ahead and, uh, you know, you can either email me or type more into the Q&A pod. The second question um, is, uh, you know, combination comment question. In terms of societal benefit and real-world application comments, how far does GHRC go in providing data or products related to impacts of this atmospheric stuff? Uh, so. At the moment, uh, we're, we're just now working on this. Uh, right now, because we are a DAC, our services are more towards um, helping provide users who do make those decisions um, be able to use our data in order to do those. Um, so we are eager to uh, pull in and archive and host additional data sets uh, to help address these societal and communi community needs as well. Um, and then we also are open to, you know, let's say if we want to make a data recipe that combines um, population information with precipitation intensity, um, we, we can work to provide resources like that. Um, they aren't available now, but those are, that's a future direction we'd like to become as we focus more on, on hazards. So uh, not there yet, but that's where we're headed. Amanda? Yes, yeah, so, so Woolen is the lightning data, and we did have lightning data collected for the HS3 field campaign. Um, some of these, these lightning network data sets um, are available, but through restrictions. So if um, you try to download them um, and 
you can't uh, easily get them, you send us an email. Um, a lot of these are available through resources such as um, if, if PIs grant approval to access them. Um, so yes, woolen data was collected, um, and however, restriction is, is limited. But you do have the uh, lightning imaging sensor data that's available, which is not restricted through GHRC, correct? Correct. And next week, there we will have, I believe still on the 14th, the lightning imaging sensor will be launched on a payload with um, another platform on the International Space Station, unless that timing has changed on the 14th, right? Yeah, it, it, it looks like it may be uh, bumped a couple days, but yes, we'll also be acquiring and archiving that data as well, so uh, look for that in the near future. All right, so the next question is, yes, but how would one get other cases included then? So Cynthia, I think um, it might be useful for me to, um, you and I to correspond offline just to kind of really dig into a little bit more as to what questions you're trying to answer, um, if that's okay. If you'd like to email me, um, and it's uh, jennifer.l.brennan at nasa.gov, uh, B-R-E-N-N-A-N, I could type it in there. Um, you're welcome. The next question is, are some of these services just mentioned available for Canadians adding Canada data sets? Um, uh, can you repeat the question? So the question is, are some of these services just mentioned available for Canadians adding, for example, adding Canada data sets? Yeah, so, so the resources and, and data sets we just mentioned, um, they are available, they should be openly accessible to most countries, especially Canada, so you can access those. Um, as far as Adding Canadian data sets, as I said, we're, we're always open to evaluating um, more, more data that uh, we can host at the DAC, um, but also create services for. Um, so we are open for input on specific uh, use cases or micro articles you as users would like to see and, and help us uh, make, this, make our data more usable to you. Okay, thank you, Amanda. And then another option might be, Walter, to, and I can email you, um, to submit a description of the Canadian data products you're referencing to NASA's Global Change Master Directory, which is kind of like an online card catalog, if you will, pointing to where these data are accessible. It includes not only our NASA data products, but other you know, university data products, other agency data products. It's not an archive, but again, points you to where these data products are. So that could also be an option available to you. Are there any additional questions? Anybody have any questions? Um, I'll give that a minute or so. Um, again, a, 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 a warm welcome and also a thank you for those of you who are beginners and who listened in for the first time today. Um, hopefully there was some information in here that was valuable to you and uh, certainly, if you have any questions, again, feel free to email me. And if it's uh, you know, a very specific question for the data holdings, I will forward you along to either Amanda or the User Services Office at the Global Hydrology Resource Center. Any additional questions? So what we'll do here, I'll, you know, if someone thinks of something, go ahead and, and enter that into the Q&A pod. If there are no further questions, what I will do is I will log off from the telecon component of the webinar, but I generally will leave the virtual meeting space open, <clears throat> excuse me, for an additional 10 minutes or so for those of you who may wish to download the presentations or if you think of a question, feel free to type that in. All right, so if there are no further questions, I would like to thank our speaker today, Amanda Weigel, and thank all of you for participating. And uh, perhaps we will see you at an upcoming webinar. And again, uh, our next webinar, which should be posted to the online catalog in the next couple of days, is on February 22nd. And they will, uh, this will feature the synthetic aperture radar data 
from our Alaska Satellite Facility uh, deck, which is used in a number of applications. Uh, I think someone mentioned, you know, uh, oil spills, because the radar data can see, if you will, through clouds, rain, et cetera. So um, something to keep an eye out for. If you're interested in receiving announcements for upcoming webinars, um, you, there's a link on the tinyurl.com Earth Data webinar. I should also note that the GHRC DAC has given other presentations in the past, which are on our YouTube channel, if you'd like to search through there um, for additional information. All right, I don't see any further questions. So again, thanks to all of you. And with that, what we'll do is we'll log off from the telecon portion, and I hope to see uh, some of you at an upcoming webinar. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. All right, thanks, Amanda. Bye-bye right. now. Bye, folks.